Well, you can't talk about UFOs and that sort of thing without getting into the area of crop circles. And the recent movie Signs with uh, Mel Gibson is an example of that. It was an uh, you know, amalgam of, of urban legends. They used corn stalks. None of the crop circles have used corn stalks, incidentally, but that's trivial. The real thing is, what about these crop circles? Many of us have heard that they're just developed by pranksters. Pranks with planks is the way most people regard them. And indeed, that probably covers many of them. I think most of you can have seen various patterns that occur in crops, in, not just in England, by the way, all over the world. They have uh, showed up uh, uh, more and more in, with increasing... In fact, there are websites that just keep track of the various styles. They are in the thousands, by the way. These are just some representative shots of them. And uh, various patterns, uh, not all of them circular, by the way, but... Um, uh, and, of course, uh, many people associate these with UFOs. Many of these patterns have cl there been observers claim there have been UFOs seen over the fields the, the, you know, the night before the crop circles are discovered, that sort of thing. So there seems to be, at least in the minds of many, an association between them. And, uh, but in 1991, two elderly artists, Doug Bauer and Dave Charlie, they came forward and uh, indicating, admitting that they had faked hundreds of these circles, and they demonstrated their technique using ropes and planks uh, and, and, and tethers and so forth to, uh, to uh, do this. In fact, they did it under journalist supervision. In fact, in some of the TV specials, you can actually see time motion where they, they uh, uh, unveil how they pulled some of these off. And if that was just it, we would probably dismiss this as an incidental topic. But, um, uh, and it does appear, by the way, that there are many of these that have some form of craftsmanship that accounts for the thousands that appear throughout the world, not just in uh, Britain, in the United States too. But let me tell you frankly, that doesn't explain them all. There's also a group of scientists that have been studying this quite rigorously and are startled with what they find on some of these circles. There are articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals that have established that not all of these things are pranks with planks. For example, biophysicist William C. Levengood, he's of the Pinlandia Phys uh, Biophysical uh, Laboratory in Michigan. Um, he's examined plants and soils from 250 crop formations, randomly selected from seven countries. And the samples and the controls of the handling of those samples were provided by the Massachusetts-based BLT research team directed by Nancy Talbot. Levengood, by the way, has published over 50 papers in scientific journals. And he's documented numerous changes in the plants and the formations. For example, most dramatically, they found grossly elongated nodes, or like knuckles, along the stem that are apparently expulsion cavities caused by the heating of internal moisture from exposure to intense bursts of radiation. The only way they can explain them. They've also taken seeds from the plants and germinated them in a lab it showed significant alterations in growth as compared to the control samples. And this has been published in the International Journal of European Societies of Plant Psychology back in 94. But it goes on and on. They find a brown glaze over some of the plants. It turns out it was pure iron that had been embedded in the plants while the iron was still molten. Tiny iron spheres were also found in the soil around those plants. And this was published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration in 1995. In 1999, a British investigator, Ronald Ashby, examined the glaze that we're talking about here through optical, scanning electron, uh, optical and scanning electron microscopes. And he de determined that the intense heat had been involved about 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, which, of course, would destroy the plants. And uh, there are hundreds of plant and soil samples were collected from a seven-circle barley formation in Edmonton, Canada. The plants had both elongated nodes and expulsion cavities that we talked about, and the soils contained these peculiar iron spheres. And the control showed that uh, none of these, in other words, control, plants that were not part of the circle did not have any of those changes. A mineralogist by the name of Sampath uh, Iyengar, Technology Materials Laboratory in California, examined specific heat-sensitive clay materials in these soils using X-ray diffraction and a scanning electron microscope. He discovered an increase in the degree of crystallinity uh, in the circle minerals in the, in the soil. 
Statistician Ravi Raghavan determined a 95% statistically significant confidence level in these findings. They have no idea what's causing it. It's clear this was not just some contrived prank for some of them. And so on it goes. Now what was really astounding was the direct correlation between the node length increases in the plants and the increased crystallization in the soil minerals. What that implies is a common energy source for both effects. So somehow there was some very intense energy. This wasn't a couple of guys with planks and, and ropes playing games. And the scientists could not explain how this is possible because the temperature required to alter the soil crystallinity would be between 1500 and 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And this, of course, would destroy the plants. So how did this happen? They don't know. But there are journals and there are uh, scientists that are wrestling with the puzzles of the crop circles. Not the crop circles in general, those that turn out to be what we'll call real ones, not, not hoaxes. And that's the problem in any research area like this. You've got so much noise, uh, it's hard to find the signal, if you will. Well, let's get to the real core of all of this. What's the biblical view? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the days of Noah. You know, Jesus uh, gave four disciples a confidential briefing on his second coming. And uh, uh, the four disciples came to him to inquire his return, and he detailed the preceding events that would uh, occur prior to his second coming. And his answer to them, these four guys, is so important, it's recorded in three of the four Gospels, in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and 22. But he opens and closes that briefing with a, a, a repeated admonition. Take heed that no man deceive you. And that occurs in Matthew 24, 4, and you'll find it's the theme of, of, of the, the entire presentation. We're dealing here in spiritual matters, and the attempt of the enemy will be to deceive us. But in the middle of this briefing, about verse 37 of Matthew 24, Jesus makes a very strange remark. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now in the context there, what he may have been alluding to is simply that it'll be business as usual until, uh, just so it was business as usual until Noah and the ark, it'll be business as usual until he returns. And most people who read that passage s assume that that's all he meant. It's just that it's going to come as a surprise. And yet there are many scholars from the context of the details of that passage feel he was giving us a hint of something deeper. And we really don't, won't understand what he's talking about unless we understand what the days of Noah were like. And so we're going to try to figure out what did, what did Jesus really mean? As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what you really need to do to get a handle on the UFO thing, strangely enough, is to do your homework in Genesis chapter 6. And I want, want you to notice the first two verses, and I want you to pay attention that the first two verses are a single sentence. Many people stumble because they don't realize that's a single sentence. I'll just see why it kind of, what I'm getting at in a minute. Genesis 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the Benaiha Elohim, the sons of God, as it's translated, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. One verse. Now the question is, um, this strange phrase, sons of God, uh, that can mean anything to us. Let's find out what the text really means, sons of God. It, what it is in the Hebrew is, remember Hebrew goes from right to left, so if you're watching the slides here, uh, remember all languages go towards Jerusalem. Nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left, the language. Nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. So just break it, so Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, uh, Sanskrit, whatever, they go right to left. Anyway, uh, so if you're reading the Hebrew here, recognize it goes from right to left. Bene ha Elohim, the, 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 the sons of the God. Now, sons of God, Bene ha Elohim is, is a term that's always used of a direct creation of God. Adam was a direct creation of God. You and I, in the natural, are not. We're sons of Adam. That's our problem. That's what the book of Romans is all about. And, uh, 
But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The term is, has technical meaning in the New Testament as well as the Old. In the Old Testament, this term in the Hebrew, in Job 1.6, Job 2.1, Job 38.7, uh, is always used of angels because they are a direct creation of God. In the New Testament, also Luke 20.36. Also, the book of Enoch. Now, I'm, don't misunderstand my use of this as a, as a citation here. The book of Enoch was very popular from about the 2nd century before Christ to the 2nd century after. It is not an inspired book. I wouldn't treat it that way. But it is useful in understanding the vocabulary and the grammar of the time. And clearly, the book of Enoch, it made, this term is used there also to refer to angels. and It deals with it greatly. The Septuagint, this is the translation of the Hebrew scriptures that went from Hebrew to Greek. If you were a, a Jew living in the time of, of uh, say, the uh, second century before Christ, the enforced language worldwide, the commercial language, was Greek. Thanks to Alexander the Great and following, uh, that was the common language. If you were a Jew uh, in business anywhere in the world, you had to speak Greek to survive. You may have known Hebrew for religious purposes. But Hebrew was to the Jew in those days what Latin is to a Catholic today, basically a language for religious purposes. So one of the things, if you were Jewish in those days, what you would have liked to have had is a copy of the, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, uh, in Greek, so you could read it. And because of that, under Ptolemy Philadelphus, he funded the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, Started about 285 B.C., finished about 270 B.C., and the result of that work product, he got 70 of the top scholars. The word Septuagint is just 70, a fancy word for, a Greek word for 70. He got the 70 top scholars to do the translation. It took about 15 years. And uh, the result of that we have copies of. And it's known as the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. And it gives us the benefit of the precision of Greek on some of these issues. So it's a very, very powerful uh, resource for scholars. And the Septuagint also makes it clear that we're dealing here with uh, uh, angels, as we think of them. Now in Genesis 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all whom they chose. The word sons of God, of course, is Benai Elohim, sons of God, direct creation, term for angels saw the daughters of men. Now, by the way, what that really says in the Hebrew is benaf adam, daughters of Adam. I mention this because there have been contrived some strange interpretations of this passage that are commonly taught in most seminaries. And it's tragic because there's a view of this passage that has no scriptural support. And we'll talk about that because you'll, you'll run into it. Many people think that, that uh, this is strange stuff. And it is strange. It's even stranger than most people realize. So... Um, now, when you get down to verse 4 of Genesis 6, it says, There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. What this verse seems to indicate is that these Nephilim were offspring of a strange union. The sons of God, these are angels according to the Hebrew uh, uh, precision here. They came in unto the daughters of men, daughters of Adam, incidentally. This is not just Cain and Seth and any of that. This is the daughter, these, these are daughters of men. And they bear children to them. It's those children that are the Nephilim. Now, what on earth is the Nephilim? That word, Nephilim, is a key word. We're going to talk a lot about that. Nephilim means the fallen one. It comes from the verb nafal, which means to fall, be cast down, to fall away, to desert. That's what a Nephilim is, a deserter, in a sense. What the passage portrays, and it's very difficult for many people to absorb this, it portrays fallen angels. These are not the good guys. Remember when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. Not all of them, but a group of them, apparently, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, chose to try to create a hybrid race by cohabiting. I don't know the technology. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into that. But they apparently uh, uh, were... See, angels can't multiply. Angels are eternal. There's a, reproduction is a process for mortals. But at the same time, Satan's got a problem. 
a third of the angels fell with him, so he's got a deficiency of two to one in any war that comes in, right? He's got to find a, find a way to strengthen himself. This may be, this is just a, con a conjecture that floats around. Now, the offspring are Nephilim. They're also called the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And uh, now, where the confusion starts to set in is when this Hebrew passage was translated into the Greek in the Septuagint, the word they used for the Nephilim was gigantes. It sounds like giants, and it turns out they were giants, but that's not what the word means. Gigantes comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Hebrew, they're called the fallen ones. In the Greek, they're called the earthborn. And uh, so let's keep that in mind. The fact that they were giants is like a pun. Yes, they were giants, but that's not what the word means. It carries a different meaning. Let's go on a little further in verse 9 of Genesis 6. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Terrific verse. We've all read it. But most of us may not pay attention to what that's really saying. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. What does that mean? Well, the word perfect in the Hebrew is tamim. What it means is without blemish. Sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. What that verse seems to indicate is that Noah's genealogy was unblemished. Now this comes on right after the verses that talk about these strange goings on where these fallen angels are, have created some weird form of hybrid, but Noah was unblemished in his gen generations and that's one of the reasons that God chose Noah and his three sons and their four wives to start over again. The purpose of the flood was not just that there was sin in the land. There was, and that's emphasized. But if, if, if sin brings the flood, we better get some life jackets. No, there's something far deeper going on. That's what I want to sensitize you for when you do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But I want you to recognize there's something much more profound that God, there's a problem that God was solving. And that is that Satan's strategy was to contaminate the human race. Now, by the way, if, if this view is correct, I'm presenting to you what's sometimes called the angel view of Genesis 6. That is not taught in most seminaries. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But if that view is correct, as I've suggested from the exegesis of the Hebrew in Genesis 6, it will be confirmed in the New Testament at least twice, and it is. When you get to the book of Jude, Jude makes an allusion to this very event in Jude verses 6 and 7. Jude is just one chapter. But in verses 6 and 7, Jude writes, And the angels, and by the way, this is in the Greek, so it's not ambiguous. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is talking about judgment on the bad guys. And he mentions among these things, these angels which sinned back in Genesis 6. These angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains. These angels that participated in Genesis 6 apparently are chained awaiting a special judgment. We'll talk, it's going to, Peter's going to talk about that in a minute. And he even, he even he, uh, Jude asks, adds something else here. He makes a comparison between the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sins of these angels in that they were doing that which is unnatural. Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality. We're all familiar with that. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He's using that as an additional exemplar, lumping the angels with him. The angels went after strange flesh, so did the Sodom and Gomorrah. They're both reserved for special judgment. You follow me? You can read it, check it out yourself. That's one confirmation. That's in Jude. Let's take a look at, uh, it, see, they left their own habitation. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And going after strange flesh is the, is the illusion here. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Second Peter, in Peter's second letter, he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, 
but cast them down to Tartarus. It's translated hell in your English Bible, but the Greek word is Tartarus, and it's the only place that word appears in the Bible. I'll come back to that. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on. So Peter does a couple of things here. He again alludes to the angels that sinned. They're cast into Tartarus. That's a, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And they're reserved unto, for a final judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. In other words, he ties that event to the days of Noah. So he not only confirms Genesis 6, but he also links it to the days of Noah. Okay. The word Tartarus deserves some comment. The problem with this word is it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible, but it does appear in Greek literature. It's the Greek term for the dark abode of woe. It is the pit of darkness in the unseen world. It shows up, in, for example, in Homer's Iliad, where Tartarus is as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So where is Tartarus? I don't know, and I don't want to find out. So Tartarus was a term for a deep, special, it, is so, it, it was regarded as, as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So it's, it's where these angels are chained until, until the final thing. Now, if you study Greek, classic Greek mythology, you run into the titans. These, these creatures in, their myth, in the legends and the myth, myths were partly terrestrial and partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus and after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned where? Into Tartarus. Do you see a parallel brewing here? I'm going to suggest to you that the legends of the ancient Greeks embody the truth of what really happened in the past, that there were these strange creatures generating hybrids that the Greek called titans. And we see Zeus in many forms. We see, we see uh, Atlas and Hercules. Atlas and Hercules from, from Greek mythology were what would be called in the Hebrew Nephilim, offspring of an intermarriage between a god and a woman. And uh, so, now these legends, we, we obviously we see in the Sumer culture, in Assyria, in Egypt, I'll show you a few things. In the Incas, the Mayan, the Epic of Gilgamesh. In the Persian mythology, and certainly in the Greek mythology, which most of us as products of Western civilization are familiar with. Also in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands. Every one of these cultures, and the American Indians, every one of these cultures have legends of the star people. These people that came, these gods or demigods, whatever, came and cohabited with women and produced, a, produced hybrids. I discover from some uh, apparent experts in the American Indian culture that this business of holding a hand up saying how, that's Hollywood. Uh, but what apparently was the practice when they met a stranger was to hold up the hand so they could count fingers. They had a terror of the six-fingered people. And if you go to uh, the ruins at Chaca, New Mexico, one, they have a, one of the exhibits there that you want to take a look at are the famous pictographs. And among those pictographs you'll find the, the fearsome six-fingered hand as part of that. The, I came across something else that's kind of... The Pawnee Indians have an account that Bill... You remember uh, Buffalo Bill? real name was William Cody. He wrote his autobiography in 1920. Very colorful guy. You can get his book. It's popular. But there's an interesting quote in his book by, Bill, by Buffalo Bill, Bill Cody, uh, published in 1920. He says, While we were in the Sand Hills scouting the Niobara uh, country... The Pawnee Indians brought into camp some very large bones, one of which the surgeon of the expedition pronounced to be the thigh bone of a human being. The Indians said the bones were those of a race of people who long ago had lived in that country. They said these people were three times the size of a man of the present day. And they were so swift and strong that they could run by the side of a buffalo and taking the animal in one arm could tear off a leg and eat it as they ran. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. It's in his autobiography. It's published in 1920. Uh, I don't think he was worried about UFOs and stuff, but you, it is an uh, interesting allusion to the Indian, Indian lessons. Uh, in the uh, early country, uh, Asher, they, ha they always speak of the flying god of Asher. And this diagram you see in many, many of the ancient uh, monuments of a, a man with a bow, 
some, like Nimrod perhaps, and, uh, the, uh, and the wings. Uh, and you see this on the monuments. Here's an example of them. As you go through Egypt, this is a, a, a snapshot in one of the tombs. Of, I think it's Ramesses II, but you see in all of them. You'll notice on the headers of these, uh, uh, of these passages, again you see a, uh, uh, the way, a flying disc again and again and again uh, as you go through Egypt. You look at the, the headers on uh, many of these monuments. You look up there and you always see the flying disc, sometimes with a snake involved. And uh, you see it again and again and again. Sometimes you see uh, uh, a person involved with these and you even find the disc being transported from place to place. So this seems to be something more than simply a symbol of, a, um, of, a, of a, some icon that they're worshiping. Well, you say, gee, Chuck, this angel view is kind of strange. I hadn't heard of that before. You know, I, when, when, our, when our book was published, I got, the, I got telephone calls from top executives of some of the Christian publishers that were angry, not at me, at their seminary background, because many of them are graduates of, of, of seminaries, and they were never taught the angel view. And uh, that's disturbing. You may not agree with it, but it still should be taught as one of the alternative views. What most people have taught, you'll find it in many Bible handbooks stuff, the so-called lines of Seth view. The idea that we're the sons of God really refers to the, 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 the line of Seth, the leadership of the line of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam really means the daughters of Cain, not Seth. And the sin that uh, is, is dominant there is their failure to maintain separation, is the concept. Now, it doesn't explain how the offspring of these unions resulted in these strange creatures. You know, if you have a believer and unbeliever marry, they may have monsters, but not, they're not monstrous. Okay. Um, this whole view of the so-called lines of Seth emerged in the 5th century in the early church. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief. See, this belief that I've shown you was taught by the ancient rabbis in, in the Old Testament period and also taught by the early church up through the 5th century. But Julian, uh, Celsus and uh, uh, Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief to attack Christianity. They made fun of these people who thought the angels and so forth. They attacked it. Julius Africanus resorted to this Sethite idea as a more comfortable ground. It's more, people find that more, less spooky. And uh, it just, uh, Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the orthodox position. Augustine comes along, who it was a profound influence, and he did many, many great things. He, he dealt with a number of heresies, but he embraced the Sethite series, and that, of course, uh, made it uh, orthodox. And so this view of this line of Seth prevailed all through the medieval church. It isn't until you go back to the text and do your homework that you begin to realize that the line of Seth has absolutely no scriptural support. The text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. That, that, that's contrived. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. The sons of God are not the sons of Seth. And uh, the daughters of Adam were not just the daughters of Cain. They were both. That if you recognize, recognize the first two verses are one sentence, a lot of that becomes very obvious. And if, if there's daughters of men, where are the daughters of Elohim? There's, if there's sons of Elohim, where's the daughters of Elohim? See, you sort of wonder, what, what, there's no mention of that. The grammatical antithesis is ignored, and I won't get to that here, but this idea of maintaining separation doesn't occur until chapter 11 of Genesis, not 6, it's five chapters later that we have the Babel and all of that. The separation is imposed upon Isaac and his following, not on Ishmael or the others. It was Isaac and Jacob that were told to keep themselves separate. And that was not imposed on Seth and Cain. That's all contrived. In fact, Genesis 6 verse 12 says all flesh was corrupted. So the idea that lines of Seth were the good guys and the line of Cain was the bad guys is contrived. That's not what it's all about. See, the inferred godliness of Seth is contrived. Why was only Enoch and Noah's eight spared? Were they only good guys? No, it's God's grace, of course. They took wives that they chose. It implies some forcing functions here. And if that's all, if Seth were such good guys, why did they perish in the flood? Doesn't, see, it doesn't, doesn't compute. And uh, it, Enosh, it was incidentally Enosh's Seth's son that initiated the defiance of God. Most people don't realize that because of mistranslation. Genesis 4.26 should read, Then men began to profane, not call upon, profane the name of the Lord. So renders the Targum of Ankylos, the Targum of Jonathan, the major Hebrew rabbis, Karp Rashi, uh, Maimonides, and the rest, and of course, Jerome. So, 
The daughters of Cain, this is not a subset of the daughters of Adam. There's no basis for that. And the Cainites were not necessarily godless. You know, I always wondered in Genesis 4 why we have the genealogy of Cain. Because they're going to all perish in the flood. Why did the scripture give us the genealogy? Well, there may be other reasons, but one reason is if you read the names, you'll find the name of God in them. You get the impression that Cain messed up, killed his brother, yes, but he raised his kids and grandchildren to worship God. He was a godly guy, and the names reveal that. So the idea that daughter, the, the, you know, the, the descendants of Cain were bad guys is, is a contrivance of modern scholarship. And why are they just daughters of Cain? Were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? What's the deal here? So that's, of course. And, of course, the, the, the death knell to this theory is that the, 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 the unnatural offspring. What were the Nephilim then? See, the, they, they were supernatural offspring, the mighty men, the Geberim. Does that mean only X chromosomes among the Sethites? There are no women of renown recorded. And, and what really made Noah's genealogy so distinctive? It wasn't contaminated by this, this, these goings on. And as I pointed out, we have these New Testament confirmations. We looked at several of them, and uh, I won't get into that here. The angel view was the traditional rabbinical view in, in the Old Testament. The Book of Enoch is just an example of their belief system, uh, emphasizes that. The Testimony of the Twelve Patriarchs, these are not inspired books, but they do reflect the thinking of the times. Jose, Josephus, clearly. Uh, understood this. The Septuagint clearly spells it out. The church fathers in the first few centuries, Philo, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them, all taught this. Modern scholarship, Pember, DeHaan, McIntosh, Dillich, Gablin, Arthur Pink, Donald Barnhouse, who I respect highly, Henry Morris, Merrill Unger, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, terrific scholar, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith, others. Modern scholarship recognizes the angel view. The Sethite view is uh, the text itself destroys it, the inferred separation is nonsense. The inferred godliness is contrived. The inferred Canaanite substitute of the Adamites is not contrived. All this is contrived. The unnatural offspring implied is the death knell to the view, in my opinion. And of course, the New Testament, Jude and Second Peter, nail it. But there's another issue as I got into this, not just for this study. It's important for us to understand that the Nephilim were not confined before the flood. We don't know how they came about. But they were Nephilim after the flood, when, Josh, when uh, Moses sends in the 12 tribes. In Numbers 13, verse 33, they encountered the Nephilim in the, in the land. Who built the pyramids? That's yet another quick ancillary question here. Who built the pyramids? The Great Pyramid of Giza, the Stonehenge in Britain, and the circle of the Rephaim in the Golan. And uh, they're up in the Golan Heights, there's an unexplored monument we discovered. Uh, up there that is called the Gilgal Rephaim. This is, who are the Rephaim? And uh, the, the, the circle of Rephaim is five circles, 20 ton stones, about 155 meters in diameter, dated to about 3000 BC. It's built on a flat plateau. And by the way, you can only detect its architecture from above, strangely, and so forth. Um, there's, there's some others too that are, if you fly over that area, you see the hints of others. These have never been explored. And uh, the point I want to get across, it's, it, it startled me to realize that this is not simply a study in Old Testament ancient history. It is essential to understand, if you're going to understand your Bible, to understand prophecy. You need to understand that there were, there were Nephilim, Nephilim after the flood. In Genesis 4, it says there were, there were um, Nephilim in those days and also after that. It even hints at it right there. In Genesis 14 and 15, we discover there are four tribes at least, the Rephaim, the Emim, the Horem, and the Zamzumim, that Joshua was instructed to wipe out every man, woman, and child. Boy, that sounds like genocide. It was. Because we had the same thing, not a flood this time, it was a local situation. And uh, Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, the Anakim, are talked about not just in the Bible, but also in Egypt, by the way. They were encountered in Canaan, Numbers 13, 33, when the, when the uh, Twelve spies went. The, when they came back, the, Joshua and Caleb had the good report. The other ten guys said, hey, there's Nephilim in the land. That's the word they used. They were giants. We are like grasshoppers in their sight. That's not an exaggeration. They had reason to be terrified. Obviously, Joshua and Caleb had uh, faith in God. We're, you know, God's on our side, let's go. But, uh, and it's easy to disparage the other ten guys. You need to understand they had, on the one hand, some reason to be cautious. In Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12, we encounter Og, the king of Bashan. He's the king of the giants, the Rephaim. Goliath, remember he had four brothers. That's why David picked up five stones when he crossed the brook. Why? He was ready for all five of those guys. See, one of the things you can go through the whole Bible and study the Bible in terms of Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. 
And when God indicates that, the, that, it's, that the, his redemptive plan is going to come from the seed of the woman, he starts attacking Adam's line in Genesis 6 with the, with the Rephaim, which of course, I mean with the Nephilim. And that's uh, God's response, of course, to the flood. Genesis 12, when God calls Abraham, now Abraham is singled out. As God refines the visibility more precisely of how his plan is going to work, it allows Satan to focus his attack. When Abraham's called, Abraham gets singled out for Satan's uh, uh, mischief. The famine in Genesis 50, the destruction of the male line in Exodus 1, Satan's attempt to thwart the... Even when they get out, Pharaoh's pursuit of, uh, of, in the Exodus. It was, um, now, when God calls Abraham, he tells Abraham in Genesis 17, 15 and 17, that there, he's going to leave there, and four centuries later, his descendants will come. Well, that lets Satan know he's got four centuries to lay down a minefield. And that's what we're dealing with here in the Rephaim in the land. And when God calls David in 2 Samuel 7, it allows Satan to focus on David. And uh, the attacks on David's line. Jerome kills his brothers in 2 Chronicles 21. The Arabians slew everyone but one, Azariah. Uh, uh, Athaliah kills all but Joash in 2 Chronicles 22. Every, every time there's an attempt to wipe out all the royal line, some servant hides a baby, whatever, there's always, uh, it slips through. And uh, Hezekiah, Isaiah 36 and 38, another example. When you get to the Persian period, here's Haman trying to wipe all the Jews, wipe out all the Jews. And uh, uh, that's Satan's strategy to try to thwart the plan of God. And had it not been for Mordecai and Esther, he, it, would, it would seem he might have succeeded. And uh, New Testament strategies. Remember Joseph fear when he found out Mary was pregnant. He was going to put her away privately. God says, no, no, don't do that. That's part of my program. Herod's attempt, when he wipes out all the babes in Bethlehem, it's Satan's attempt to wipe out God's plan. At, 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 when they, at Nazareth, in Luke 4, when Jesus uses Isaiah as his mandate for his ministry, Isaiah 61, we've got to throw him off a cliff, but he slips away. In Mark 4 and Luke 8, there are storms at sea, and I think they're both supernatural ones. That's why Jesus rebuked the sea and so on. And, of course, the ultimate thwart was the cross. The cross. And this is all summarized in Revelation chapter 12. You can study it there carefully. But the main point of all of this is that Satan is not finished yet. And that may be what the UFOs are, are, are a preamble to. By the way, what does the Golan Heights, Hebron, and the Gaza Strip have in common? They're in the Newsday all the time, right? These are the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate the Rephaim. The word Rephaim means the dead, the walking dead. Isaiah 26, 14 says they cannot be resurrected. These are strange creatures. And uh, it's interesting if you study the strongholds uh, that uh, they fail to defeat, you'll notice that those same regions are the territories, the so-called West Bank, that are in dispute today. I think that's fascinating. The, the Joshua's, not Joshua, but his, his descendants failed to deal with these issues, and they plagued them to this very day. The Golan was called uh, Bashan, and it's just when Jesus is hanging on the cross in Psalm 22, verse 12, he says a strange thing. He says, Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. I have no idea what that means, but I suspect he's not talking about cattle. I think he's talking about some kind of demon oppression that's involved. I think it's, a, and it's an allusion to the Rephaim. Let's talk a little bit about the nature of angels because that's really at the root of this problem. You notice we learn a lot about angels by looking at the Bible. They always appear in human form. They look human. In fact, many people entertain them unaware as we find out. Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the homosexuals were after them. That tells you something. I don't want to be too graphic here. And at the resurrection and at the ascension, there's always a pair of angels. And they're like men. They look like men standing there. They spoke. They took men by the hand. They ate meals with them. They're capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was by a death angel. In the in, uh, book of uh, 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 Second Kings, uh, slaughter of the 185,000 Syrians. One angel after night slaughters 185,000 Syrians. You don't mess around with angels. Now, and they don't marry in heaven. Now, that, that, that's a phrase. By, and by the way, I'm making a contrast here. With the demons of the New Testament are not like this. They apparently are powerless except to the extent they can embody some person. 
They're not like angels. Don't think, distinguish between angel, fallen angels, the bad guys, and the demons. The demons apparently are disembodied spirits looking for embodiment. The angels don't have that problem. They apparently can materialize. All the way through the scripture, we see them that way. We do know they don't marry. Can, the question that everybody has, can angels have sex? The scripture says no. No, it doesn't say that. Jesus says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. He's talking about uh, 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 that in a resurrection bodies, we don't have sex because we, we're immortal. There is no procreation. There is no uh, reproduction issue. And angels, in, he's talking here about the angels of God in heaven. I would not speculate on the technologies available to an angel who falls. And that's what we're dealing with here. Now, there's a strange word that gets overlooked by the scholars uh, in general, and, and I've, I've participated in some translation issues on this very issue. There's a word called okaterion, and it refers to the body as the dwelling place for the spirit. It only occurs twice in the scripture, and it's very interesting where it does. It occurs in Jude 6, and it's the word that describes what the fallen angels disrobed from. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, it speaks of, it alludes to the heavenly body that you and I as believers aspire to be clothed in. Same word, okay, I think it's a technical term that's overlooked by the scholars. In uh, Jude 6 and 7, it says, when the angels which kept not their first estate left their own habitation, that word habitation is okaterion. They disrobed from the, 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 the body that they were given to indulge in this mischief in Genesis 6. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their ha own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness in the ju judgment of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and so on, we went through that before. The word is Okaterian. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, Paul tells the Corinthians, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. The word translated house is okaterion. That which those angels abandon is what we aspire to. That kind of, that kind of a, uh, a habit, if you will. Okaterion again. Anyway, let's talk about something else we talked about earlier and mentioned earlier we should get into. Alien abductions. You know, the disturbing thing is there's continuing a deluge of cases being reported that are too weird, too bizarre to take seriously on the one hand, but they're too frequent and too consistent to ignore. And uh, estimates of 1 to 3 percent of our population have been reported in the professional journals. They, all the strange episodes seem to involve the implanting or the harvesting of human fetuses as a primary topic. It seems that if these creatures are real, they're very preoccupied with the human reproductive process. And that causes us to wonder, could this be leading to a repetition of the strange events of Genesis 6? Is it possible that this is the hint that is included in Jesus' remark, as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming son of man be? Dr. John Max, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, MD, he, uh, uh, head of psychiatry for uh, Harvard's uh, uh, hospital there, and uh, he's written on this area. He says, the idea that men and women and children can be taken against their wills from their homes, cars, or schoolyards by strange humanoid beings lifted into spacecraft and subjected to intrusive and threatening procedures is so terrifying and yet so shattering to our notions of what is possible in our universe that the actuality of the phenomenon has been largely rejected out of hand or bizarrely distorted in most media accounts. This is altogether understandable, given the disturbing nature of UFO abductions and our prevailing notions about reality. The fact remains, however, that for 30 years and possibly longer, thousands of individuals who seem to be sincere and of sound mind and who are seeking no personal benefit from their stories have been providing to those who will listen consistent reports of precisely such events. By the way, John Mack has personally dealt with 76 cases himself. He's profiled others. These are people above average intelligence with no prior psychiatric history that clearly are subject to some kind of trauma. And there was a, a conference on this abduction phenomenon at MIT. 
And John Mack was one of the co-chairmen of that conference. And he says, if what these abductees are saying is happening to them isn't happening, what is? He's saying, what's, what's really going on here? Here's Mack's challenge to the professionals that were there assembled. The high degree of consistency of the stories, the absence of any prior psychiatric illness, the physical changes in lesions. Some of these people have scars from the procedures, and I've encountered one myself on that. Independently witnessed by others while the abductions are taking place. There's not many, but there are a few. The involvement of small children is disturbing. Not likely they could be conditioned by, you know, the... Well, let's move on. The coming to cosmic deception, what's the biggest lie of all? You know, it's interesting. This all started back in Genesis 3, when God declared war on Satan. He says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Everybody, and from this verse, we get one of the messianic titles of Christ, the seed of the woman. What many people overlook, there's two seeds mentioned here. The other seed is the seed of the serpent. And so we have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent, we find all kinds of idioms, the red dragon in, in, in Revelation 12, the coming world leader, as I sometimes call him, the false prophet in Revelation 13. These forces are still at work and behind the world powers today. Check out Daniel 10 and really understand what's going on there. All of us have studied Daniel 2 and the, the sequence of nations, or empires, I should say that were re-echoed in Daniel 7, the winged lion, bear on one side, the leopard, the terrible beast, the ten heads. Uh, again, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, one and two. Uh, we've been through that in our st prophetic studies. and Most people recognize the iron, iron mixed with clay is, is the Roman Empire. Don't confuse that with Western Europe. The Roman Empire, uh, part one and part two. Well, we live in a world, what's, what's going on in this world? There's a new world order, a world without borders is the concept. The end of the independent nation state. Multiculturalism is in. Check your faith at the door. We're going to all compromise. And this is all heading for a centralized socialistic government. And there are a couple of forcing functions. Every freedom-loving per person considers this an anathema, except the problem is there's no way to avoid it. Nuclear proliferation is part of it. We're on the threshold right now of nuclear war because of this very issue. But there's another forcing function that nobody talks about. The possibility, ultimately, not yet, but coming, a cosmic threat of some kind. You say, Chuck, that's way out. That's fringe stuff. Really? Um, let's talk about the miry clay. You know, Daniel, in Daniel's famous vision of the metal, multi-metal image, the last phase was, of course, the iron mixed with clay, the ten toes. What is miry clay? Miry clay is clay made from mire or dust, if you will. And everybody talks about the, 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 the clay in, in, in the ten toes of Daniel's imagery. No one, I'm, I'm guilty too, paid any attention to Daniel's explanation of it. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, he's explaining the whole thing. He's interpreting the vision for you. When he gets to this, in verse 43, he says, Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, and so on. You know, that phrase, I read that a hundred times over the last 30 years and didn't hit me until uh, this in-depth study. Um, they, the, the miry clay refers to a they, it's a personal pronoun, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In order to mingle themselves with the seed of men, they have to be something other than the seed of men. Or it makes no grammatical or, or logical sense. So the they that are going to do the mingling are not the seed of men. Oh, could this be a hint? of some mischief in the end times analogous to the uh, uh, mischief in Genesis 6. I think so. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Boy, there it, stare, it stares at me. Well, it, speaking of UFOs in the end times, you know, I remember uh, Walter Martin, I was on his board for many years. I, my partner and I were the guys that brought him to the West Coast. And we, we, because of his very, very critical minis uh, uh, you know, ministry to comparative religions, we tried to keep him off this subject because we felt it would discredit his ministry. Uh, I don't hesitate these days for two reasons. One is I've got nothing to lose. My ministry is probably just great. Anyway, uh, but also times are a little more uh, lucid these days. But in any case, I can remember Walter it, it, using any excuse. He would get to Luke 21, 26, and he'd quote this, men's heart failing them for fear for, and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And he, whenever he did that, he always gestured with his hand. Men's hearts failing themselves for fear and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And he would he'd make sort of an inverted saucer with his hand as it was landing. He'd say, coming, and he'd just gesture with it. He, he saw UFOs here. 
and for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And I'm not to say he's wrong, but we used to always smile. Walter, get off that subject. Anyway, uh, but the coming great deception, Jesus opens and closes his Matthew 24 thing. He says, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. What's going to protect you? Your intellectual background? Your knowledge of physics? No way. No way. If it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. The only thing, the only thing that can save you from this deception is your spiritual condition by being in Christ. They shall show great signs and wonders. They're going to do things that are going to uh, uh, violate apparent, our apparent knowledge of reality. When we get to 2 Thessalonians, Paul in, in 2 Thessalonians 2 has a lot to say about this. He says, The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The wicked one is going to do miracles. Be prepared for some political leader to raise people from the dead. We're not ready for that. The mystery, see, I think the restrainer is restraining far more than you and I have any idea. I, more than we have capacity to imagine. I think after the rapture, it's going to get so strange, it's going to be way out there. Now, where does this wicked one come from? It surprises many to realize the scripture tells us. In Revelation 11 and Revelation 17. Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Where is this guy coming from? From out of the abuso. So he's not just some political leader that happens to be kind of gifted. No, this guy is empowered by Satan himself. And he's coming out of the abuso himself. You get to Revelation 17. The beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, go into perdition, and they that dwell among the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life. The only thing that can protect you from all of this is your position in Christ. Second Thessalonians goes on, and because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Don't assume that, if you, that you can get saved after the rapture. People will be saved after the rapture. But if you've had an opportunity and turned down the redemption of Christ, this is what it's talking about. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and for this cause God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Be careful. Don't play that game. If you're going to accept Christ, do it now. Don't wait, or you'll be vulnerable to the big deception. Now, the most absurd war is coming. I always fasten with Psalm 2, which is a dialogue among the Trinity. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And it goes on. This whole idea that the world is going to take up Arms against, um, take up arms against God himself astonishes me. I can understand people not believing God or rejecting God, yes. I can't imagine going after him warfare. I, it just doesn't make sense. Why would the world go after him? I think, I, I think, I think the uh, Nephilim thing will explain it. You know, it's interesting that the alien types, if you read all, you, go through, you wallow through all this literature, Dr. Mark Eastman and I have spent a lot of time this going through that stuff, you'll discover there's three types of these so-called alien creatures that emerge. The greys, those are the diminutives, short, you always see them in the, in the, in the entertainment media. There's another group that seem to appear, called, but sometimes called the Nordics or the Palladians. They, they, they're it's about six foot tall, they're blonde, blue eyed, they look like people. Could be around us now. And there's a third group that are the most grotesque of them all, what they sometimes called the reptilians. These are scaly, weird creatures that look like a refuge from some grade B science fiction movie. There's weird stuff. Well, these three always, these always show up. It's interesting, in Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14, I've always wondered, how does the world go to war against God? And John tells us, I saw three unclean spirits like what? Like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. I think God is going to use some kind of strange creatures, demonic or whatever, to draw the world into this confrontation that is part of the, 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 the climax that Revelation and the Old Testament deal with. Well, what's our challenge, you and I? Let's wrap it up. 
I'm going to give you a statement that I want you to challenge. Don't accept what I say or you flunk. I want you to challenge what I'm about to say, although I believe it sincerely. I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement. But I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about the whole gospel period. Now, we monitor and, and publish uh, backgrounders and uh, weekly updates on 10 strategic trends and uh, we continue on our website and in our publications. There are major prophetic themes about Israel, about Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple, about Babylon, about the coming invasion of the Middle East by Russia, Magog, if you will, the rise of China as a superpower, the decline of the United States, or I'll call the American challenge, the European superstate that's emerging, the move towards an ecumenical religion while all this is going on as the Pope embraces Islam, <laughs> global government as we see the nations struggle to, to, uh, in that direction, and there's a, uh, there is a, a, uh, another trend called the rise of the occult and UFOs. Watch for it. Now the ultimate issue, of course, is none of this. The ultimate issue is that you and I are in possession of a message of extraterrestrial origin and it's the only competent source to deal with these extraterrestrial issues. And this, this record, we call the Bible, portrays us as the objects of an unseen warfare. And our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of that cosmic conflict. And where do you stand? What is your readiness for this encounter? And you can't protect yourself with your intellect. You can't protect yourself with your knowledge base in the traditional sense. It's a spiritual battle, and you need to understand that. Paul tells us that in, Rome, in Ephesians 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And what's your remedy? Your spiritual armor. Ephesians 6 details seven elements of armor should be girded with truth. Take on the breastplate of righteousness. The feet, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take your shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. And uh, don't forget your heavy artillery prayer. Now each one of these is, uh, is part of your spiritual armor. And twice Paul emphasized put on the whole armor of God, not just your favorite pieces. To do that you've got to know what these are. And you need to do a very in-depth study of each of these six elements, and obviously, I should say seven elements. Um, uh, we don't have time to do that here, but we, I urge you to make a commitment to do a serious study of these things. And don't forget the seventh. Many people stop at verse 17. Don't go to verse 18. All right, we have a 24-hour hotline to the throne room of the universe, and he's anxious to hear from us. And we call it prayer. Is that your heavy artillery? Keep that in mind. Now, these strategic trends that we, we monitor on our website. Weapons of mass, each one is a biblical trend, each one is a uh, uh, standard category of uh, data collection by the intelligence community, and uh, we tend to monitor them. Weapons of mass destruction, the rise of Islam, the struggle for Jerusalem, the Magog invasion, the rise of the European superstate, the rise of China, biotech and global pestilence is another one, ecumenical religion, global government, and the American challenge. Now each one of these uh, we have backgrounders on. Each one of these is on our website, and there's no passwording required. You can get your background by just dialing in. We also will give you a weekly update. Once a week, we, we call it e-news. If you will sign on our website, give us your email address, no charge. You can, do, you can turn it off when you, if, you, if and so you want to. We will send you each week one page summary of what happened this week that's biblically relevant, and we'll give you the links as to who's following that competently. No charge. It's part of our ministry to keep make you aware of the times in which we live and its spiritual ramifications. So what do you do besides this? We also publish, probably the most popular things we've done, Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. It's available as a book and it's also available as a CD-ROM with over 1,400 computer animated diagrams. And it will take you from Genesis to Revelation in 24 one-hour sessions. That sounds audacious, but 24 one-hour sessions accompanied by computer-aided diagrams covers a lot of ground. What it'll do is give you a grasp, a respect for the integrity of the whole package, and you'll be able to navigate all the way through whatever issue you may have.
If you survive that ordeal, we also publish expositional commentaries on each book of the Bible, verse by verse, with detailed notes, diagrams, and what have you, and they're available on a week-to-week -week -week basis or in, as packages. They're also now available on CD-ROM, which makes them much less expensive and also allows many of them to be accompanied by, with uh, computer animated diagrams. We also publish uh, topical briefings. Most of you may be familiar with our briefings. We have uh, probably uh, well over 80, maybe 100 topics, biblical, scientific, geopolitical, what have you. And we're also starting to get into videos like the one that you're watching. And uh, we have other resources, of course, a monthly news journal that the first year is free if you sign up for that. Our internet site is the flagship of our entire ministry. I encourage you to, to look it over. It's been much heralded. We're one of the oldest sites on the net, and we have a, ter a really talented team. The Lord has really blessed us with both the team and the content and the response to it. Uh, the strategic t uh, trends, of course, are monitored there. We also publish e-news, which I've mentioned. Those are free, by the way. Emphasize that. Free. <laughs> We're also a host of the Blue Letter Bible. We participated in its, its early days. It's an English, Hebrew, and Greek text with commentaries, dictionaries, encyclopedias. It's all word searchable. It's all free. But the main thing we have is something that's maybe new to some of you, and that's the Berean Online Fellowship. Mo many of you are familiar with our K-Rations program. That's where you have a tape a week subscription program. It includes a 10-minute update and then a verse-by-verse -verse study on some book of the Bible. Many of you may be familiar with that, and that's still going. And we accompany that, of course, with diagrams and study materials for group study, and, and uh, you can even arrange to have uh, course credit for that, uh, university recognized. Uh, we publish this typically in heirloom edition leather-bound albums. For those that are collecting them, they have a way to keep them organized. And there's, it is a university-approved uh, level all the way to the PhD level uh, with arrangements we've made. But the thing that we want to announce to you, we have a new program called the Berean Online Fellowship. Each week you get the verse-by-verse -verse study in real audio or MP3, um, and that includes the notes and so forth. It also includes a weekly global intelligence update, just a little 10-minute what's going on kind of thing. It gives you also access to all our verse-by-verse -verse commentaries in real audio. It's all available to the subscribers, the members of the fellowship. Uh, we have, uh, you also will get personal uh, update, our news journal, online immediately, and it, you'll still get your hard copy by mail. But the, perhaps the most exciting thing is we have online discussion groups. All our members can share and talk about topics, and there's, and, uh, there's a whole chat room structure behind that. And uh, I, part I participate uh, in that, and so does our staff. Um, and of course, all of this is done in the context of getting university degree credit all the way to the PhD level. And there's all kinds of uh, members only offers and privileges in terms of access and other things that we're doing. So that's going to be our primary online fellowship. Uh, uh, 